Kipps by H.G. Wells. Until he was nearly arrived at manhood, it did not become clear to Kipps how it was that he had come into the care of an aunt and uncle instead of having a father and mother like other little boys. He knew that a certain faded, wistful face that looked at him from a plush and gilt-framed daguerreotype above the mantel of the sitting room was the face of his mother. But the phantom mother that haunted his memory so elusively was not like that, though he could not remember how she differed. It was clear, however, that she handed him over to his aunt and uncle at New Romney with explicit directions and a certain endowment. One gathers she had something of that fine sense of social distinctions that subsequently played so large a part in Kip's career. He was not to go to a common school, she provided, but to a certain seminary in Hastings that was not only a middle-class academy with mortarboards and every evidence of a higher social tone, but also remarkably cheap. She seems to have been animated by the desire to do her best for Kipps, even at a certain sacrifice to herself, as though Kipps were in some way a superior sort of person. His aunt and uncle were already high on the hill of life when first he came to them. They had married for comfort in the evening or, at any rate, in the late afternoon of their days. They were at first no more than vague figures in the background of proximate realities, such realities as familiar chairs and tables, pieces of firewood, old newspapers, the cat, the high street, the backyard, and the flat fields that are always so near in that little town. His aunt and uncle were, as it were, gods of this world, and, like the gods of the world of old, occasionally descended right into it. And, unhappily, one rose to their Olympian level at meals. Then one had to say one's grace, hold one spoon and fork in mad, unnatural ways called properly, and refrain from eating even nice sweet things too fast. Sometimes, however, these gods gave him broken toys out of the shop, and then one loved them better. For the shop they kept was, among other things, a toy shop. They neither visited nor received visitors. They were always very suspicious about their neighbours, and other people generally. They feared the low, and they hated and despised the stuck-up, and so they kept themselves to themselves, according to the English ideal. Consequently, little Kipps had no playmates except through the sin of disobedience, and he began a friendship with Sid Pornick, the son of the haberdasher next door that, with wide intermissions, was destined to last his lifetime through. Pornick the haberdasher, I may say at once, was, according to old Kipps, a blaring jackass, a teetotaler, and a nya nya im singing Methodist. This Pornick annoyed old Kipps greatly. Cavendish Academy, the school that had won the limited choice of Kipps' vanished mother, was established in a battered private house in the part of Hastings remotest from the sea. Its principal was a lean, long creature of indifferent digestion and temper, who proclaimed himself on a gilt-lettered board in his front area, George Garden Woodrow, F.S.S.C., letters indicating that he had paid certain guineas for a bogus diploma. The memories Kipps carried from that school into afterlife were set in an atmosphere of stuffiness and mental muddle, and included countless pictures of sitting on creaking forms, bored and idle. But interspersed with the memories of this grey routine were certain patches of brilliant colour. The holidays, his holidays, which, in spite of the feud between their seniors, he spent as much as possible with Sid Pornick. They seemed to be memories of a different world. They were glorious days of mucking about along the beach, the siege of unresisting Martello Towers, the incessant interest of the mystery and motion of windmills, the windy excursions with boarded feet over the yielding shingle to Dungeness Lighthouse. The holidays were indeed very different from school. They were free, they were spacious, and though he never knew it in these words, they had an element of beauty. 
In his memory of his boyhood, they shone like strips of stained glass window in a dreary waste of scholastic wall. The last of these windows was the brightest, and its glory was a single figure. For in the last of his holidays, before the Moloch of retail trade got hold of him, Kipps made his first tentative essays at the mysterious shrine of love. And the object of these first stirrings of the great desire was no other than Sid's sister, Anne. Negotiations were already on foot to make Kipps into a draper before he discovered the lights that lurked in Anne Pornick's eyes. School was over, absolutely over, and it was chiefly present to him that he was never to go to school again. He was up before six on the day of his return, and half-past eight found Kipps sitting on the sunlit gate at the top of the long lane that runs towards the sea. There appeared along by the churchyard wall a girl in a short frock, brown-haired, quick-coloured, and with dark blue eyes. She had grown so that she was a little taller than Kipps, and her colour had improved. He scarcely remembered her. Some vague emotion arose at the sight of her. He stopped whistling and regarded her, oddly tongue-tied. "'He can't come,' said Anne, advancing boldly. "'Not yet.' "'What? Not Sid?' "'No. Father's made him dust all his boxes again.' Oh. Pause. Kipps looked at her and then was unable to look at her again. You left school? She remarked after a pause. Yes. So said. Anne put her hands on the top of the gate. Can you run? She said presently. Run you any day, said Kipps. Give me a start. Where for? said Kipps. Anne considered and indicated a tree. Give it a here, she called. Kipps, standing now and touching the gate, smiled to express conscious superiority. Further, he said. Here? Bit more, said Kipps, and then, repenting of his magnanimity, said, Off! suddenly, and so recovered his lost concession. They arrived abreast at the tree, flushed and out of breath. Tie, said Anne, throwing her hair back from her face with her hand. I won, panted Kipps. They disputed firmly but quite politely. Run it again, then, said Kipps. I don't mind. They returned towards the gate. You don't run bad, said Kipps. I'm pretty good, you know. Anne sent her hair back by an expert toss of the head. "'You give me a start,' she allowed. They became aware of Sid approaching them. Anne prepared to go. "'How about another race?' asked Kipps. "'Law!' cried Sid, quite shocked. "'You ain't been racing her!' Anne swung herself round the end of the gate with her eyes on Kipps, and then turned away suddenly and ran off down the lane. I give her a lot of start, said Kipps, apologetically, and so the subject was dismissed. But Kipps was astray for some seconds, perhaps, and the mischief had begun in him. The two friends were pensive for a space, and then Sid began to discourse on fragments of love, a theme upon which Kipps had already, in a furtive way, meditated a little, but which, apart from badinage, he had never yet heard talked about in the light of day. And so they budded. I would like to have a girl, said Kipps. I mean, just to talk to and all that. At last they were drawn dinnerward and went home hungry and pensive side by side. But Kipps' imagination had been warmed by that talk of love, and in the afternoon when he saw Anne Pornick in the high street and said, Hello. It was a different hello from that of their previous intercourse. And when they had passed, they both looked back and caught each other doing so. And when he was in bed, he put his head under the pillow and whispered very softly, I love Anne Pornick. In the morning, he could hear Anne singing in the scullery next door, and it was clear to him that he must put things before her. 
Towards dusk that evening they chanced on one another, out by the gate by the church. Anne sat up upon the gate, and her eyes looked at Kipps from a shadowed face. There came a stillness between them, and quite abruptly he was moved to tell his love. Anne, he said, I do like you. Will you be my girl? Anne made no pretense of astonishment. If you like, Hardy, she said lightly, I don't mind if I am. All right, said Kipps, breathless with excitement. Then you are. All right, said Anne. Something seemed to fall between them. They no longer looked openly at one another. La! cried Anne suddenly. See that one! And jumped down and darted after a cockchafer. And with that, they were girl and boy again. They avoided their new relationship painfully. They did not recur to it for several days. But all the while, Kip's imagination was urging him to that unknown next step. It became evident to him that it would be nice to take Anne by the hand. Then a great idea came to him in a paragraph called Lover's Tokens that he read in a torn fragment of titbits. It fell into the measure of his courage. A divided sixpence. He fished a sixpence out of his jejune tin money box, and when they met again he endeavoured to explain the theory of broken sixpences and his unexpected failure to break one. But what you break it for? said Anne. It's no good if it's broke. It's a token, said Kipps. Tell you what, she said. You let me have it, Artie. I know where father keeps his file. Kipps handed her the sixpence, and they came upon a pause. In considering the sixpence side by side, his head had come near her cheek. Anne, he said, I do love you. He paused for breath. Anne, I wish you'd... He stopped. What? said Anne. Anne, let me kiss you. Things seemed to hang for a space. Then Anne perceived that she was not prepared for kissing after all. Kissing, she said, was silly. And when Kipps would have displayed a belated enterprise, she flung away from him. A certain estrangement took them homeward. They arrived in the dusky high street not exactly together, and not exactly apart, but straggling. Kipps lay awake for nearly half an hour that night, groaning because things had all gone wrong. And then, with paralysing unexpectedness, came the end. Mr. Shalford, the draper at Folkestone to whom he was to be bound apprentice, had expressed the wish to shape the lad a bit before the autumn sale. Kipps became aware that his box was being packed. He became feverishly eager to see Anne just once more, and within half an hour of his departure he came on Sid. Hello, he said. I'm off. Business? Yes. Pause. I say, Sid, you going home? Straight now. Do you mind? Ask Anne. About what? She'll know. And Sid said he would. But it failed to evoke Anne. At last the Folkestone bus rumbled up and he ascended. The bus was in motion and old Kipps was going back into his shop. Then Kipps heard a door slam and instantly craned out his neck to look back. He knew that slam so well. Behold, out of the haberdasher's door a small untidy figure in homely pink print had shot resolutely into the road and was sprinting in pursuit. Artie! she cried breathlessly. Artie! Artie! You know, I got that! The bus was already quickening its pace and leaving her behind again when Kipps realised what that meant. He became animated and gathered his courage together and mumbled an incoherent request to the driver to stop just a jiff for something. Anne leapt up upon the wheel. Kipps looked down into Anne's face and he met her eyes just for one second as their hands touched. 
something passed quickly from hand to hand, something that the driver, alert at the corner of his eye, was not allowed to see. All she said was, I done it this morning. Then she dropped down and the bus moved forward. When Kipps left New Romney to become a draper, he was a youngster of 14. Thin, with smallish features, and by the nature of his training, he was indistinct in his speech, confused in his mind, and retreating in his manners. Inexorable fate had appointed him to serve his country in commerce, and the same national bias towards private enterprise now indentured him firmly into the hands of Mr. Shalford of the Folkestone Drapery Bazaar, the Emporium. Mr. Shalford was an irascible, energetic little man with hairy hands, for the most part under his coat tails. He walked lightly and with a confident jerk, and he was given to humming. He spread himself out behind his desk with a grip of the lapel of his coat and made Kipps a sort of speech. We expect you to work, you know, and we expect you to study our interests. Our system here is the best system you could have. I made it, and I ought to know. Mr. Booch in the desk will give you the card of rules and fines. Mr. Shalford rose. Booch, he said, have you a copy of the rules? Mustn't fumble like that, said Mr. Shalford as Kipps pocketed the rules. Won't do here. Come along, come along and he led the way into the shop. A vast, interminable place, it seemed to Kipps, with unending shining counters and innumerable faultlessly dressed young men and presently hoary-like young women staring at him. A thick-set young man with a bald head and a round, very wise face who was profoundly absorbed in adjusting all the empty chairs down the counter awoke out of his preoccupation and answered respectfully to a few Napoleonic and quite unnecessary remarks from his employer. Kipps was told that this young man's name was Mr. Buggins, and that he was to do whatever Mr. Buggins told him to do. They came round a corner into a new smell which was destined to be the smell of Kipps' life for many years, the vague, distinctive smell of Manchester goods. A fat man with a large nose jumped at their appearance. Car shot. See to this boot tomorrow, said the master. See you don't fumble. Smarten him up. The indentures that bound Kipps to Mr. Shalford were antique and complex. They insisted on the latter gentleman's parental privileges. They forbade Kipps to dice and game. They made him over, body and soul, to Mr. Shalford for seven long years the crucial years of his life. In return, there were vague stipulations about teaching the whole art and mystery of the trade to him. But as there was no penalty attached to negligence, Mr. Shalford, being a sound, practical businessman, considered this a mere rhetorical flourish. What he put into Kipps was chiefly bread and margarine, infusions of chicory and tea dust, colonial meat by contract at threepence a pound, potatoes by the sack, and watered beer. He was also allowed to share a bedroom with eight other young men and to sleep in a bed which, except in very severe weather, could be made, with the help of his overcoat and private underlinen, not to mention newspapers, quite sufficiently warm for any reasonable soul. In return for these benefits, he worked so that he commonly went to bed exhausted and footsore. On Sundays he was obliged to go to church once, and commonly he went twice, for there was nothing else to do. In the intervals between services he walked about Folkestone with an air of looking for something. He never read a book. There were none for him to read. His chief intellectual stimulus was an occasional argy-bargy that sprang up between Carshot and Buggins at dinner. Kipps listened as if to unparalleled wisdom and wit. 
At times there came breaks in this routine. Sail times, darkened by extra toil and work past midnight, but brightened by a sprat supper and some shillings in the way of premiums. And every year Mr. Shalford, with parenthetic admiration of his own generosity, conceded Kipps no less than ten days' holiday. Ten whole days every year! There were times when Kipps would lie awake, all others in the dormitory asleep and snoring, and think dismally of his outlook. Dimly he perceived the thing that had happened to him, how the great stupid machine of retail trade had caught his life into its wheels. This was to be his life until his days should end. No adventures, no glory, no change, no freedom. Anne, too, had happened on evil things. When Kipps went home for the first Christmas after he was bound, he hurried out and whistled in the yard. There was a silence, and then old Kipps appeared behind him. "'It's no good you whistling there, my boy,' said old Kipps in a loud, clear tone designed to be audible over the wall. "'They've cleared out. All you had any truck with. She's gone as hell to Ashford, my boy.' "'And Sid?' Sid had gone too. Aaron boy or something, said old Kipps, to one of these here blasted cycle shops. When Kipps got upstairs safe in his own bedroom, he sat down on the bed and stared at nothing. They were caught. They were all caught. After a time, the sorrows of Kipps grew less acute, and, save for a miracle, the brief tragedy of his life was over. He subdued himself to his position, seeing, moreover, no way out of it. The earliest mitigation of his lot was that his soles and ankles became indurated to the perpetual standing. The next was an unexpected weekly whiff of freedom that came every Thursday. In a little while, Kipps cleaned windows no longer, he was serving customers, of the less important sort, and taking goods out on approval. And presently, he was third apprentice. There came still other distractions, the natural distractions of adolescence to take his mind off the inevitable. His costume, for example, began to interest him more. He began to realise himself as a visible object, to find an interest in the eyes of the girl apprentices. In this he was helped by counsel and example. In due course, Kipps went to a tailor, and his short jacket was replaced by a morning coat with tails. Most potent help of all in the business of forgetting his cosmic disaster was this, that so soon as he was in tailcoats, the young ladies of the establishment began to discover that he was no longer a horrid little boy. It was one of the young ladies in the costume room who first showed by her manner that he was capable of exciting interest. She allowed him to escort her to church. She went for a walk with him to the pier on Sunday afternoon and explained to him generally the broad beginnings of the British social ideal. Very soon he was engaged. Before two years were out, he had been engaged six times and was beginning to be rather a desperate fellow. The engagements in drapery establishments do not necessarily involve a subsequent marriage. They were essentially more refined, less coarsely practical, and altogether less binding than the engagements of the vulgar rich. These young ladies do not like not to be engaged. It is so unnatural, and Mr. Kipps was as easy to get engaged to as one could wish. This development of the sex interest was continuously very interesting to Kipps, and kept him going as much as anything through all these servile years. Though these services to Venus Epipontia and these studies in the art of dress did much to distract his thoughts, it would be mere optimism to present Kipps as altogether happy. A vague dissatisfaction with life drifted about him. He perceived great bogs of ignorance about him, fumbling traps, where other people, it was alleged, real gentlemen and ladies, for example, and the clergy, had knowledge and assurance. The ripening mind sought something upon which its will might crystallise. 
and it led Kipps finally into technical education. It was in the last year of his apprenticeship that he had pursued his researches at the Folkestone Young Men's Association, where Mr Chester Coote prevailed. Mr Chester Coote was a young man of semi-independent means, a whitish-faced young man with a prominent nose, pale blue eyes and a quivering quality in his voice. To Kipps and his kind in the Young Men's Association, he read a stimulating paper on self-help. It was a casual article on technical education in a morning paper that a commercial traveller left behind him that stimulated Kipps to the pitch of inquiring about the local science and art classes. And just as the March winds were blowing, he was precipitated into the wood-carving class. The class in wood-carving was an extremely select class, conducted at that time by a young lady named Walshingham. And as this young lady was destined by fortune to teach Kipps a great deal more than wood carving, it will be well if the listener gets the picture of her correctly in mind. She was only a year or so older than he was. She had a pale intellectual face, dark grey eyes, and black hair which she wore over her forehead in an original and striking way that she had adapted from a picture by Rossetti in the South Kensington Museum. She dressed in those loose and pleasant forms and those soft and tempered shades that arose in England in the socialistic aesthetic epoch. I think she was as beautiful as most beautiful people, and to Kipps she was altogether beautiful. The class consisted of two girls and a maiden lady of riper years, friends of Miss Walshingham's. To an elderly oldish young man with spectacles and a black beard, a small boy who was understood to have a gift for wood carving, and a lodging housekeeper who took classes every winter, and occasionally Mr. Chester Coote, refined and gentlemanly, would come into the class with or without papers, ostensibly on committee business, but in reality to talk to the less attractive of the two girl students, and sometimes a brother of Miss Walsingham's. A slender, dark young man who was training to be a solicitor would arrive just at the end of the class time to see his sister home. All these personages impressed Kipps with a sense of inferiority. He heard them speak easily and freely to one another of examinations, of books and paintings, and of last year's academy, a little contemptuously. It was clear his only chance of concealing his bottomless baseness was to hold his tongue and meanwhile he chipped with earnest care and abased his soul before the very shadow of Miss Walshingham. Then there came a time when she could not open one of the classroom windows. It did not take Kipps a moment to grasp his opportunity. Let me, he said. Oh, please don't trouble, she said. It's no trouble, he gasped. Still the sash stuck. He felt his manhood was at stake. He gathered himself together, and the pain broke with a snap, and he thrust his hand into the void beyond. There, said Miss Walshingham. Then Kipps made to bring his hand back, and felt the keen touch of the edge of the broken glass at his wrist. You've cut your wrist, said one of the girl friends standing up and pointing. You have cut your wrist, said Miss Walshingham, and Kipps regarded his damage. You must tie it up said Miss Washingham. If you will give me your hand, said the freckled girl, and proceeded with Miss Walshingham's assistance to bandage Kipps in a most businesslike way. And Miss Walshingham's face, the face of that almost divine overhuman, came close to the face of Kipps. We're not hurting you, are we? she said. Not a bit, said Kipps, as he would have said if they'd been sawing his arm off. Of course, I'm quite willing to pay for the window, panted Kipps opulently. Put your finger on the knot, dear, said the freckled girl. He met Miss Walshingham's eyes and smiled. It's only a little cut. I'm sure it must hurt, said Miss Walshingham. I'm afraid you won't be able to go on carving tonight. I'll try, said Kipps. It really doesn't hurt. Presently, Miss Walshingham came to him as he carved heroically. "'I'm afraid you're not getting on very fast,' she said. The freckled girl looked up and regarded Miss Walshingham. 
I'm doing a little anyhow, said Kipps. I don't want to waste any time. A fellow like me hasn't much time to spare. He went to sleep that night, revisiting that conversation for the twentieth time, treasuring this and expanding that, and inserting things he might have said to Miss Walshingham. The affair of the broken window happened late in April, and the class came to an end in May. In that interval there were several small incidents and great developments of emotion. I have done Kipps no justice if I have made it seem that his face was unsightly. It was, as the freckled girl pointed out to Helen Walshingham, an interesting face. They talked him over. It was quite evident to the freckled girl that Kipps was in love with Helen Walshingham, and it struck her as an extremely interesting phenomenon. Under her sympathetic management, the position of Kipps was presently defined quite clearly. He was unhappy in his position, misunderstood. He told her he didn't seem to get on like with customers, and she translated this for him as too sensitive. The discontent with his fate in life revived to its old acuteness. And at the next woodcarving class, Kipps let it be drawn from him that his real choice in life was to be an author. Only one doesn't get a chance. And one day, the girl with the freckles smote him to the heart. She said to him, I do think Helen Walshingham is sometimes the most lovely person in the world. Look at her now. Kipps gasped for a moment. You're right, he said hoarsely. And then, with terrible swiftness, came the last class of the course. The end began practically in the middle of the last class when the freckled girl broached the topic of terminations. She developed the question of just how he was going on after the class ended. She hoped he would stick to certain resolutions of self-improvement. He expressed firm resolve, but dwelt on difficulties. He had no books. She instructed him how to get books from the public library. After that talk, there was an interval of languid woodcarving and watching Miss Walshingham. Then presently there came a bustle of packing. There came a little pause, and the freckled girl suddenly went back into the classroom and left Kipps and Miss Walshingham alone together for the first time. She looked at his face with a glance that mingled sympathy and curiosity and held out her white hand. Well, goodbye, Mr. Kipps, she said. He took her hand and held it. I'll do anything, said Kipps, and had not the temerity to add, for you. There was a little pause. I hope you will have a pleasant holiday, she said. I shall come back to the class next year anyhow, said Kipps. I hope you will, said Miss Walshingham. He turned back towards her. Really? he said. I hope everybody will come back. They looked at one another through a little pause. Goodbye, she said. The hour of the class on the following Thursday found Kipps in a state of nearly incredible despondency. He went down Dover Street in a state of profound melancholia, and there it was that fortune came upon him. His hat was over his eyes and an enormous weight rested on his shoulders. Then he was on all fours in some mud. He arose and found himself confronting a figure holding a bicycle. "'You aren't hurt, matey!' gasped the figure. "'Was that you hit me?' said Kipps. "'It's these handles, you know. They're too low. I was coming downhill, you know.' "'Here's the back of my trouser leg all tore down,' said Kipps. "'And I believe I'm bleeding.' The stranger investigated the damage with a rapid movement. Holy smoke, so you are! I say, look here! Come out to my diggings and sew it up. I'm... Of course I'm to blame, and I say... His voice sank to a confidential friendliness. Here's a slop. Don't let on I ran you down. Haven't a lamp, you know. Might be a bit awkward for me. Kipps looked up towards an advancing policeman. All right, he said. Go on. Right you are said the cyclist promptly, and led the way. Of course, 
said Kipps, limping slightly. I don't want to get a chap into trouble. Accidents will happen. Oh, rather! He laughed, and they went on their way while the policeman stared, curious. You aren't the first I've run down, you know, not by any manner of means. Most men, after a bump like that, might have been spiteful, but I tell you, the way you caught on about that slop was something worth seeing. When I asked you, I didn't half expect it. Biff! Right off! Cool as a cucumber! You acted like a gentleman over that slop. Kip's first sense of injury disappeared. He limped along a pace or so behind, making deprecatory noises in response to these flattering remarks, and taking stock of the very appreciative person who uttered them. As they passed the lamps, he was visible as a figure with a slight anterior plumpness, progressing buoyantly on knickerbockered legs. A cycling cap was worn very much on one side, and from beneath it protruded carelessly straight wisps of dark red hair. He had no moustache. The cyclist propped his machine carefully against the window and produced a key. An interval, and Kipps was dazzled by a pink-shaded kerosene lamp. "'You go in,' said the red-haired man, "'and I'll bring in the bike.' And for a moment Kipps was alone. He took in rather vaguely the shabby ensemble of the little apartment. Then the cyclist reappeared, and Kipps saw his blue, shaved, rather animated face. He was a man perhaps ten years older than Kipps, but his beardless face made them, in a way, contemporary. "'Whiskey there is, and there's some brandy. Which will you have?' "'I don't know,' said Kipps, taken by surprise. "'Well, whiskey then. Right you are, old boy.' He laughed and retired, leaving Kipps free to make a more precise examination of the apartment's contents. He particularly remarked, in the shadow by the window, a rough and rather able sketch of the bicyclist, in chalk on brown paper, labelled unmistakably Chitterlow. Presently, this Chitterlow reappeared with a starry labelled bottle in his large, freckled hand. Sit down, old chap, he said. Sit down. As he spoke, Mr. Chitterlow produced a corkscrew from a table drawer, attacked and overcame good old Methuselah's cork. Kipps took his tumbler, said thanks in an offhand way, and put it to his lips. For a space, fire in his throat occupied his attention to the exclusion of other matters. And then he discovered Mr. Chitterlow with an intensely bulldog pipe alight, seated on the opposite side of the empty fireplace. "'After all,' said Mr. Chitterlow, "'this accident might have been worse. "'I wanted someone to talk to a bit. "'It's curious. "'Here we are, sitting and talking like old friends, "'and half an hour ago we didn't know we existed. "'Leastways, we didn't know each other existed. <laughs> "'Have a cigarette?' Kipps made a confused reply that took the form of not minding if he did, so Chitterlow produced a tobacco pouch and cigarette papers and made Kipps a cigarette. Then Kipps had his glass replenished. He began to feel he was of a firmer consistency than he commonly believed and turned his mind to what Chitterlow was saying. Meanwhile, Chitterlow explained that he was a playwright. "'There's any amount of money in a good play.' "'I dare say,' said Kipps, drinking." And as Chitterlow talked on and on in that full, rich, satisfying voice he had, old Methuselah, indisputably a most drunken old reprobate of a whisky, busied himself throughout Kipps, lighting lamp after lamp, until the entire framework of the little draper was illuminated and glowing. Boom, 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 the clock struck. Law, said Kipps, that's not eleven. Must be said Chitterlow. It was nearly ten when I got that whisky. I must be going. The house door shuts at half past ten, you know. Well, if you must go... Why, there's your leg, old man. You can't go through the streets like that. I'll sew up the tear, and meanwhile, have another whisky. In fact, I'm hanged if I wouldn't like your opinion on these first two acts of that tragedy I'm on to. I haven't told you about that. It wouldn't take me more than an hour to read. Then, so far as he could subsequently remember, Kipps had another. And then it would seem that, suddenly regardless of the tragedy, 
He insisted that he really must be getting on, and from that point his memory became irregular. His next memory was of the exterior of the Emporium, shut and darkened. It appeared to Kipps that that establishment was closed to him forevermore. Whereupon Chitterlow slapped him on the back very hard and told him that that was a bit of all right, and that Kipps must come down home with him. You can sleep on the sofa! They came into the presence of old Methuselah again, and that worthy under Chitterlow's direction at once resumed the illumination of Kipps' interior. And with infinite deviousness, Chitterlow came at last to his play. And it seemed to Kipps that Chitterlow went on and on like a river. So he eyed Chitterlow with a baleful eye until it dawned upon him that a most extraordinary thing was taking place. Chitterlow kept mentioning someone named Kipps. Look here, he said suddenly. My name's Kipps. Eh? said Chitterlow. Kipps, said Kipps, smiling a little cynically. What about him? He's me. Kipps leant forward very gravely towards Chitterlow. You haven't no business putting my name into a play. And they had a little argument, so far as Kipps could remember. Chitterlow entered upon a general explanation of how he got his names. These he had, for the most part, got out of a newspaper that was still, he believed, lying about. Kipps awoke on the thoroughly comfortable sofa that had had all its springs removed. He awoke with what Chitterlow pronounced to be quite indisputably a head and a mouth. He acted on Chitterlow's advice to have a bit of a freshener before returning to the Emporium, and then he went to face the inevitable terrors of the office. Just for a moment he was glad that his patch at the knee was, after all, visible, and that some at least of the mud on his clothes had refused to move at Chitterlow's brushing. What wouldn't they think he had been up to? Then he recollected Mr. Shalford. He got to the Emporium a little before eight, and the housekeeper, with whom he was something of a favourite, seemed to like him, if anything, better for having broken the rules, and gave him a piece of dry toast and a good hot cup of tea. Then he went down to the shop a little before time, and presently Booch summoned him to the presence. He emerged from the private office after an interval of ten minutes. Buggins scrutinised his visage, then put the frank question. Kipps answered with one word. Swapped, he said. He leant against the fixtures with his hands in his pockets and talked to the two apprentices under him. I don't care if I am swapped, said Kipps. I was a good mind to chuck it in when my time was up, which I had now. Afterwards Pierce came round and Kipps repeated this. What's it for? said Pierce. That row about the window tickets? No fear, said Kipps. I wasn't in last night, he said. Why? Where did you get to? asked Pierce. He conveyed that he had been fair round the town, with an actor chap I know. One can't always be living like a curate, he said. And when they pressed for still further details, he said there were things little boys ought not to know. And in this manner, for a space, did Kipps fend off the contemplation of the key of the street that Shalford had presented him. This sort of thing was all very well when junior apprentices were about, but when Kipps was alone he felt, to tell the truth, nasty and dirty. The financial aspect of things grew large before him. His whole capital in the world was the sum of five pounds in the post office savings bank and four and sixpence cash. Besides, there would be two months' screw. He would have to go home to his uncle and aunt. In the perplexed privacies of his own mind, he could not understand how everything had happened. It was the morning following Kipp's notice of dismissal that Miss Walshingham came into the shop. She came in with a dark, slender lady whom Kipps was to know some day as her mother. The two ladies were both bent over a box of black ribbon. Then, as Miss Walshingham sat back, the instinct of flight seized him. Directly he was out of sight of her, though, he wanted to see her. He bolted back again into the main shop. He could hear his own heart beating. The two ladies were standing in the manner of those who have completed their purchases. 
Helen's eyes searched the shop. They distinctly lit up when they discovered Kipps. How are you, Mr. Kipps? she said in her clear, distinct tones, and she held out her hand. Very well, thank you, said Kipps. How are you? She said she had been buying some ribbon. He became aware of Mrs. Walsingham very much surprised. Then came a pause, and Kipps' soul surged within him. He wanted to tell her he was leaving and would never see her again. The swift seconds passed. Well, said Miss Walsingham. Goodbye, and gave him her hand again. Kipps bowed over her hand. He rushed for the door. He remained holding the door open for some seconds after they had passed out, then rushed suddenly to the back of the costume window to watch them go down the street. Gone! It was as though someone had struck his heart with a whip. Now, in the slack of that same day after the midday dinner, the disastrous Chitolo descended upon Kipps. Seen by daylight, Chitolo was not nearly such a magnificent figure as he had been by the subdued nocturnal lightings. Kipps decided to go outside as if to inspect the condition of the window. Hello, Chitlow, he said, emerging. Very man I want to see, said Chitlow. How old are you, Kipps? One and twenty, said Kipps. Why? Talk about coincidences. And your name now? Wait a minute. Is it Arthur? Yes, said Kipps. It's about the thickest coincidence I ever struck. He laughed and struggled with a fragment of newspaper and read from it. Don't say your mother's name wasn't Euphemia, Kipps, and spoil the whole blessed show. Let me see what it says in that paper. Kipps attempted to read. Waddy or Kipps. If Arthur Waddy or Arthur Kipps the son of Margaret Euphemia Kipps, who Chitlow's finger swept over the print. I went down the column, and every blessed name that seemed to fit my play I took. Who was Waddy? Never heard his name. Kipps tried to read again. What does it mean? he said. It means, said Chitlow, with a momentary note of lucid exposition, so far as I can make out, that you're going to strike it rich. Kipp's air of perplexity gave place to a more confident bearing. Who was born at East Grinstead? I certainly was born there. I've heard my aunt say, on September the 1st, 1878. And all you have to do is to write to Watson and Bean and get it. Get what? Whatever it is. But what do you think it is? That's the fun of it, said Chitlow. It may be anything. It was just five days and a half after that a young man with a white face emerged from a side road upon the Lee's front. He was dressed in his best clothes. He scanned each house narrowly as he passed it and presently came to an abrupt stop. Huendon, said the gateposts in firm black letters. Gollies, he said at last. He walked past away from it and finally drifted away to the seafront and sat down. A very stout old gentleman sat down beside him. An impulse overwhelmed Kipps. You wouldn't think, said Kipps, indicating with his forefinger, that that house there belongs to me. Don't be a fool, said the old gentleman. It's been left me this very morning. Presently Kipps got up and went on down a quiet side street unbuttoned his coat furtively, took out three banknotes in an envelope, and looked at them. He became suddenly very anxious to tell everybody at the Emporium, absolutely everybody, all about it. He entered the Emporium through the Magister Department. He flung open the door and came up in front of the counter. "'I say,' he said, "'what do you think?' "'What?' said Pierce over the pin. "'Been left a fortune.' "'Get out!' Straight, I've been left twelve hundred pounds, twelve hundred pounds a year, said Kipps, and I'm going. It happened that Mr. Shalford was in London buying summer sale goods and no doubt also interviewing aspirants to succeed Kipps, so that there was positively nothing to hinder a wild rush of rumour from end to end of the Emporium. 
I'm sure if anyone deserves it, it's Mr. Kipps, said Miss Murgle, and her train rustled as she hurried to the counting-house. And there stood Kipps amidst a pelting shower of congratulations. Good old Kipps, said Pierce, shaking. Good old Kipps! I'm sure we all congratulate him, said Miss Murgle. When Kipps found them all standing up to toast him, there came such a feeling in his throat and face that for the life of him he scarcely knew for a moment whether he was not going to cry. They did him honour. Unenviously and freely, they did him honour. The bus that plies between New Romney and Folkestone is painted a British red. This bus it was that came down the Folkestone Hill and trundled through Sandgate and Hythe with Kipps and all his fortunes on its brow. He held a banjo, sceptre fashion, and resting on his knee. He had always wanted a banjo. Now he had got one while he was waiting for the bus. The sun set before the bus came lumbering into New Romney. Hello, Uncle, said Kipps. Plundering ninny, said old Kipps. What's brought you here? The living room door opened quickly, and Mrs. Kipps appeared. If it ain't young Artie, she said. Why, whatever's brought you home? Hello, Aunt, said Artie. I've had a bit of luck. You ain't thrown up your place, Artie, have you? said Mrs. Kipps. Kipps perceived his opportunity. I have, he said. He exploded with laughter. It's all right, aunt. I've been left money. I've been left twenty-six thousand pounds. Pause. And you thrown up your place? said old Kipps. Yes, said Kipps. Rather. It's somebody after your place, very likely, said old Kipps. Kipps looked from one sceptical, reproving face to the other. But, he said, it's all right, really, uncle. I had a letter. I saw an old gent, uncle. Perfect gentleman. Said his name was Watson and Bean. Leastways, he was Bean. Said it was left me by my grandfather. Old Kipps uttered an exclamation and wheeled round towards the mantel shelf. Waddy, his name was, said Kipps. Waddy, said old Kipps. Waddy, said Mrs. Kipps. She'd never say, said old Kipps. There was a long silence. Why, that young chap that was asking questions, said old Kipps. James, said Mrs. Kipps in an awe-stricken voice. After all, perhaps it's true. How much did you say he'd left you, me boy? Twelve hundred pounds a year. He made his will just before he died. When he was dying, he seemed to change, like Mr Bean said. He'd never forgive his son, never, not till then. His son had died in Australia, you know. At last, Kip's flaring candle went up the narrow, uncarpeted staircase to the little attic that had been his shelter and refuge during all the days of his childhood and youth. His head was whirling. His uncle was chiefly for his going into Parliament. His aunt was consumed with a great anxiety. I'm afraid he'll go and marry beneath him. There comes a gentlemanly figure into these events, a good influence, a refined and amiable figure, Mr Chester Coote, you must figure him as about to enter our story walking with a curious rectitude of bearing through the evening dusk towards the public library. He was a loyal house agent and a most active and gentlemanly person. It was in the public library that he came upon Kipps. By that time Kipps had been rich a week or more and the change in his circumstances was visible upon his person. He was wearing a new suit of drab flannels a Panama hat, and a red tie for the first time, and he carried a silver-mounted stick with a tortoiseshell handle. "'What are you doing here?' asked Mr Chester Coote. Kipps was momentarily abashed. "'Oh,' he said slowly, and then, mooching round a bit, 
Ah, said Mr. Coote. I haven't yet had an opportunity of congratulating you on your good fortune. Kipps held out his hand. The conversation hung for a moment. Are you getting a book? asked Coote. Well, I haven't got a ticket yet, but I shall get one, all right, and have a go in at reading. Then Kipps jumped at an idea he had cherished for a day or more, not particularly in relation to Coote, but in relation to anyone. You doing anything? he asked. Because would you care to come and have a look at my house and have a smoke and a chat? Eh? At his own gate, Kipps became extremely nervous. It was a fine, impressive door. They were admitted by an irreproachable housemaid with a steady eye, before which Kipps cringed dreadfully. There's a fire in the study, Mary? He had the audacity to ask, though evidently he knew, and led the way upstairs, panting. He tried to shut the door, and discovered the housemaid behind him coming to light his lamp. Coote went to the hearthrug and turned and surveyed his host. Here we are, said Kipps, hands in his pockets, and glancing round him. It was a gaunt, Victorian room. This, said Kipps, in something near an undertone, was the old gentleman's study. My grandfather, that was. He used to sit at that desk and write. Books? No, letters to the Times and things like that. Won't you sit down? For a space, Kipps played a defensive game and Coote drew the lines of the conversation. It speedily became evident that he was a person of wide and commanding social relationships. Coote sat back in the armchair, smoking luxuriously. You'll have a good time, he said abruptly, with a smile that would have interested a dentist. I don't know, said Kipps. There's mistakes, of course. That's just it. Coote lit a new cigarette. "'One can't help being interested in what you will do,' he remarked. "'I got to go careful,' said Kipps. "'Oh, Bean tell me at the very first. Coote went on to speak of pitfalls, of betting, of bad companions. "'There's doubt as well,' said Coote. "'I know a young fellow, a solicitor, handsome, gifted, and yet, you know, Utterly sceptical. Law, said Kipps. Not an atheist. I fear so, said Coote. Full of this dreadful modern spirit. Cynical. Modern life is so complex. It isn't everyone is strong. Half the young fellows who go wrong aren't really bad. That's just it, said Kipps. It struck Kipps what a tremendously good chap this Coote was. "'Companionship accounts for so much,' said Coote. "'That's just it,' said Kipps. "'Of course you know in my new position. "'That's just the difficulty.' "'He plunged boldly at his most secret trouble. "'He knew that he wanted refinement, culture. "'It was all very well, but how was one to get it?' "'Kipps spoke of his respect for Miss Walshingham and her freckled friend.' You know, I'd like to talk to people like that, but I can't. Of course, said Coote. Of course. I went to a middle-class school, you know. You mustn't fancy I'm one of these here board school chaps, but, you know, it really wasn't a first-class affair. If I had someone like you, said Kipps, that I knew regular-like. From that point, their course ran swift and easy. If I could be of any use to you, said Coote. I'm rather a lonely dog myself, actually. I've not had anyone I've spoken to so freely for months. Coote displayed all his teeth in a kindly, tremulous smile, and his eyes were shiny. Shake hands, said Kipps, deeply moved. And he and Coote rose and clasped with mutual emotion. And so their compact was made. Kipps went to bed at last with an impression of important things settled, and he lay awake for quite a long time. There was much to learn. Sheer intellectual toil, methods of address, bowing, an enormous complexity of laws, 
Suppose some day one met royalty. How did one address royalty? From such thoughts this free citizen of our crowned republic passed insensibly into dreams. Turgid dreams of that vast ascent which constitutes the true-born Britain's social scheme, which terminates with retrogressive progression and a bending back. The next morning he came down to breakfast looking grave, a man with much before him in the world. There were several things by the post, tradesmen's circulars and cards, and two pathetic begging letters. He was just contemplating these when in came Chitterlow. Hello, said Kipps, rising. Not busy, said Chitterlow. Only a bit of reading, said Kipps. Reading, eh? I've been expecting you round again one night. I've altered that play tremendously since I saw you, he said. Pulled it all to pieces. What play's that, Chitlow? The one we were talking about. Oh, yes, said Kipps. I remember. I thought you would. Said you'd take a fourth share for a hundred pounds. You know. I seem to remember something, said Kipps. Chitlow interrupted his discourse. You haven't any brandy in the house, have you? Not a drink, you know, but I want just an egg cupful to pull me steady. My liver's a bit queer. Yes, whiskey'll do. Better. After, they had both had whiskies and Chitterlow paced the room. He was, he explained, taking a day off. Presently, they were descending the steps by the parade en route for the Warren, with Chitterlow doing the talking and going with a dancing drop from step to step. They had a great walk, and in the clutch of Chitterlow, Kipps came round to the house in Fenchurch Street and was there made to participate in the midday meal. He came to the house forgetting certain confidences and was reminded of the existence of a Mrs. Chitterlow to whom he was introduced. About four, Kipps found himself stranded, as it were, by a receding Chitterlow on a seat upon the lees. He was chiefly aware that Chitterlow was an overwhelming personality, no doubt this was seeing life. But had he particularly wanted to see life that day? The day he had designed for himself was altogether different from this. That reminded him he had intended to perform a difficult exercise called an afternoon call upon the Coots, as a preliminary to doing it in deadly earnest upon the Walshinghams. It was no good today, anyhow, now. He came back to Chitterlow. He would have to explain to Chitterlow he was taking too much for granted. This half-share and taking a theatre and all of it was going too far. The quarter-share was right enough, he supposed, but even that. A hundred pounds. What wealth is there left in the world after one has paid out a hundred pounds from it? The Coots lived in a little house in Bouvery Square with a tangle of Virginia creeper up the veranda. A queer little maid with a big cap admitted Kipps and took him through a bead curtain and a door into a little drawing-room. Coote came in and they went upstairs together and had a good talk about reading and the rules of life. Or rather, Coote talked and the praises of thought and reading were in his mouth. "'Nothing enlarges the mind,' said Coote, "'like travel and books. "'And they're both so easy nowadays and so cheap.' I've often wanted to have a good go in at reading, Kipps replied. You'd hardly believe, Coote said, how much you can get out of books, provided you avoid trashy reading, that is. There came at last the sound of a gong, and Kipps descended to tea in a state of nervous apprehension. Over Coote's shoulder he became aware of a fourth person in the Moorish cosy corner, and he turned to discover this fourth person was Miss Helen Walshingham. She rose at once with an extended hand to meet his hesitation. "'You're stopping in Folkestone, Mr. Kipps?' "'Ear on a bit of business,' said Kipps. "'I thought you was away in Bruges.' "'That's later,' said Miss Walshingham. "'We're stopping until my brother's holiday begins. "'Where are you staying in Folkestone?' "'I got a house of mine, on the Lees. "'I've heard all about your good fortune this afternoon.' "'Isn't it a go?' said Kipps. "'I haven't nearly got to believe it's really happened yet.' He discovered Miss Coote was asking him whether he took milk and sugar. "'I don't mind,' said Kipps. "'Just as you like.' Presently Miss Walshingham turned her face to him almost suddenly, 
and smiled with the easiest assurance of friendship. You will go, I suppose? To the recital. If I'm in folks, then I shall, said Kipps, clearing away a little hoarseness. <coughs> I don't know much about music, but what I do know, I like. I'm sure you like Paderewski, she said. If you do, he said, I dare say I shall. Do you think of living in Folkestone? asked Miss Coote in a tone of proprietorship from the hearthrug. No, said Kipps. That's just it. I hardly know. Helen regarded him thoughtfully for a moment. You must come and see us, she said, before we go to Bruges. Oh, rather, said Kipps, if I may. Yes, do, she said. When Kipps made his call on the Walshinghams, he was quite lost from the very outset. Instead of the footman or maidservant proper in these cases, Miss Walshingham opened the door to him herself. She stood aside for him to enter the rather narrow passage. I thought I'd call, he said. She closed the door and led the way to a little drawing room. You won't think it unconventional to come in, Mr. Kipps, will you? she remarked. Mother is out. I don't mind, he said, smiling amiably, if you don't. She walked round the table and stood regarding him across it. I wondered whether you would call or whether you wouldn't before you left Folkestone. I'm not leaving Folkestone for a bit, and anyhow I should have called on you. Mother will be sorry she was out. She's gone out to make some duty calls. I had something to write. I write a little, you know. Really? said Kipps. It's nothing much, she said. One must do something. She broke off abruptly. Have you seen our outlook? she asked, and walked to the window. We look on the square. It might be worse, you know. I like it, said Kipps. A suggestion that might have come from a book his uncle had found him called The Art of Conversing came into his head. Have you a garden? he said. Only a little one, she said, and then, perhaps you would like to see it. I like gardening, said Kipps, with memories of a pennyworth of nasturtiums he had once trained over his uncle's dustbin. They emerged through a Four Seasons coloured glass door to a little iron veranda that led by iron steps to a minute walled garden. That's our garden, said Helen. It's not a very big one, is it? I like it, said Kipps. If you were writing when I came, he remarked, I'm interrupting you. She turned round with her back to the railing and rested, leaning on her hands. I had finished, she said. I couldn't get on. Were you making up something? asked Kipps. There was a little interval before she smiled. I try, quite vainly, to write stories, she said. They ought to satisfy me, but they don't. I suppose I'm ambitious. I believe you could do anything you wanted to if you tried. I know, said he very sagely. I watched you once or twice when you were teaching that wood carving class. For some reason this made her laugh and that made Kipps feel a very witty and successful person. It's very evident, she said, that you're one of those rare people who believe in me, Mr. Kipps. To which he answered, Oh, I do and then suddenly they became aware of Mrs. Walshingham coming along the passage. "'Mr. Kipps has called on us,' said Helen, and Mrs. Walshingham said it was very, very kind of him. He remained about two hours, having forgotten how terribly incorrect it is to stay at such length. They did not mind at all. Within two months Kipps had clambered to the battlements of heart's desire. It all became possible by the Walshinghams deciding not to spend the holidays at Bruges, Instead, they remained in Folkestone.